Let's ask a man who many believe should be Prime Minister, could deliver Brexit and uh, could actually uh, get Theresa May out of power and take over. Well, his name is Jacob Rees-Mogg. He's chairman of the European Research Group. He's a Tory MP for North East Somerset and a member of the Brexit Select Committee and joins us now. Good morning to you, Jacob. Good morning, Julia. That was quite an introduction. Well, well, this is what people are saying. Uh, First question, do you agree with David Davis and Boris Johnson that the Prime Minister's proposed Chequers agreement doesn't deliver real Brexit? Yes, I do. Um, uh, Over the weekend, I only raised questions on what had been agreed because I was surprised that members of the Cabinet had gone along with something that seemed on the face of it to be tying us into the European Union one way or another. Uh, And once David Davis and Boris Johnson set out their resignation reasons, it became clear that Brexit um, and Chequers are not the same thing. Uh, It it would certainly appear so. In his resignation letter, Boris Johnson has uh, talked about how the dream is dying, suffocated by needless self-doubt, and saying it is as though we're sending our vanguard into battle with the white flags fluttering above them. It doesn't sound like Brexit is going to be delivered. So what are you going to do about it? Well, there is some encouraging news, and that is that the law setting out our departure from the European Union is in place. So... The Article 50 Act was passed before the general election and the Withdrawal Act came into force about two weeks ago. That means that with nothing else happening, we would leave the European Union on the 29th of March next year without a deal. Any deal that the Prime Minister gets has to be voted through Parliament and voted into law. And if it's this bad deal from Chequers that keeps us in effectively the acqui communautaire, the EU rule book, which is subject to the European Court of Justice for all the Prime Minister says, the European Court of Justice would remain effectively the Supreme Court uh, in goods and agri-goods. And that won't get through Parliament. People like me will vote it down. Have you got the numbers to vote it down? Well, it depends what the opposition does. Um, but if the, La- if the Labour Party decides to support the government uh, and have a sort of German-style grand coalition, uh, then the government could get it through. They, well, they, the Labour, Party, Labour leadership has basically said, and certainly the likes of Keir Starmer, the shadow Brexit secretary, has said basically, you know, any deal is better than no deal. So it sounds like they would support it. Well, I think there are considerable splits in the Labour Party. We'll have to see what the Labour Party does. But for a government to get its business through on the back of opposition votes is really unstable territory because the opposition may vote for you one day, but it won't vote for you the next. Um, Given that the Prime Minister is saying one thing, uh, and Michael Gove, another leading Brexiteer, the Environment Secretary, uh, agrees with her and saying, yeah, look, this, you know, this Brexit deal that we're offering, again, it's not a deal we've got with the EU. No one's bothered to actually, you know, officially send it to the EU yet. We don't know what they're going to make of it. Uh, But even the new uh, Brexit Secretary, Dominic Raab, again, another staunch Eurosceptic, is backing up to this deal. Um, Is this a matter of interpretation when the likes of David Davis, Boris Johnson, yourself and others who say... this isn't Brexit in real life and, and this is Brexit in name only. Is it a matter of interpretation or are either you or they lying to the British people? Um, I think you need to look at the nuance of what Michael Gove is saying. He said that he doesn't think the deal is everything that he hoped for. Uh, the reason he's accepted it is that he thinks that we can leave in law and then improve on the situation afterwards. Now, I happen to think that once we have an international treaty and it is legislated for, that will be extraordinarily difficult. So I don't think any Eurosceptic is saying this is a perfect deal. I think you'll find the Eurosceptics who have remained in the Cabinet are saying, well, they can live with this in the expectation of being able to get something better afterwards. In my view, the prospect of getting something better afterwards is unrealistic. Um, and in terms of the Eurosceptics who you represent, the European Research Group, is it, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of those MPs turned up for a meeting with you uh, last night uh, after the 1922 committee meeting with the Prime Minister. Uh, many are very angry, very upset with the Prime Minister. Uh, a number of those uh, ERG members said to me over the weekend they were going to be writing to the chair of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, uh, to basically say a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister. We don't know how many letters he has. We won't know until he has less or until he has 48 do you know how many have voted, have, have written letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister? Uh, no, I don't. I have no idea. I have no better idea than anybody else. And Sir Graham Brady's made it very clear that he 
uh, will not give anybody any indication of how many letters he's received. He views it as a confidential matter unless and until he gets 48, at which point he has to announce it. You've said, but you've said that you would not support a vote of no confidence. In the event of a vote of, a vote of confidence in the leadership of the Prime Minister, you would vote to support her. Why? Well, what I said was that in a vote of confidence in the House of Commons, I would support the Prime Minister. That's because I don't want to uh, have a general election. There isn't a vote of confidence in either case at the moment. Uh, but um, uh, I don't think many people want to have another election. We've only had one a year ago, and a vote of confidence in the House of Commons under the Fixed-Term Parliament Act potentially well, automatically precipitates a general election uh, unless another government can be formed uh, involving other people. So that's the, the vote of confidence that I would are support you, the Conservative Party. Are you putting party before country at this point? I don't think so. I, I don't quite follow that question. Well, if, if the country's voted for Brexit and this government isn't going to deliver Brexit, uh, as if the Brexit secretary and the foreign secretary don't think this is delivering Brexit, uh, it's a fairly good indicator. A lot of Eurosceptic MPs don't believe this is going to be a real Brexit. At that point, would it not be better to bring down the government, certainly bring down Theresa May, to try and have a chance of her prime minister, maybe yourself, who could deliver Brexit? I think the, the problem with that hypothesis is that the government in waiting is um, led by Jeremy Corbyn, and I don't think At Jeremy Corbyn... At least he's a Eurosceptic. <laughs> I don't think Jeremy Corbyn, considering the Labour Party, I accept that Jeremy Corbyn is um, personally a Eurosceptic, but his party isn't. And I think the idea that the Labour Party in office would deliver a better Brexit, even than the failure of Chequers, uh, is unrealistic. So, no, it's not putting party before country. It's trying to get the best outcome, a proper, clean Brexit that delivers on what was promised to the voters. You mentioned the mood at the um, European Research Group meeting, and the greatest sense was one of sadness, really, that the Prime Minister had promised to do things, and that in checkers had run away from those promises, that all those statements, Brexit will mean Brexit, we're not going to be half in, half out, all the things that she had said before seemed to be swept away by giving in uh, to, to uh, pressure from the European Union not to have a proper Brexit. Um, uh, yesterday, Nigel Farage, the former leader of UKIP, now, of course, just a UKIP MEP, uh, he has talked about going back into politics uh, full, you know, full strength himself. Uh, but he also, speaking to James Whale, my colleague here on Talk Radio, had a little word to say about who he thinks should be leading the Tory party. Have a little listen. I think the one man who maybe could just catch the imagination of the public because of his absolute sincerity and honesty, is Jacob Rees-Mogg. Really? Yes, really. He's, you, uh, James, you, he's <laughs> honest. He's, he's, he's <laughs> honest. He's straight with me. And people. would you work under uh, him, then, as a Tory? Well, I don't... Listen, we're miles away from that. I just... You know, I'm not interested in having a career in politics. Mm, no, no. I just want this country to be no. independent, and I want us mm. to lead uh, the rest of Europe towards a better Europe for everybody. And once that's done... You know, I can go back to going fishing and going down the pub. Well, that's what Nigel Farage had to say, Jacob Rees-Mogg. You've got Nigel Farage's vote. Are you ever going to be leader of the Conservative Party? Um, I'm a backbench MP. Uh, that um, Since Stanley Baldwin became leader, yeah. the Conservative Party, when in office, has always chosen a former home foreign uh, or secretary or chancellor to be prime minister. Now, I know the numbers of um, these great offices are increasing in terms of former holders with all the resignations that are going on, uh, but that is the pool from which historically the Conservative Party draws, uh, not, not from uh, obscure backbench MPs. You're a sort of school backbench MP. Can I just ask you one final question? Dominic Raab is the new Brexit secretary, staunch Eurosceptic, a uh, very strong campaigner on that front. Does it matter, though, who's in the Brexit secretary job since the, the Brexit negotiations are being run by civil servant Ollie Robbins? Uh, as so often, you um, put your finger on the issue that um, what is the point of the Brexit department if all the decisions are made in Downing Street and that's at the heart of David Davis's resignation letter that if you think about this 120 pages that was presented at Chequers, uh, this was drawn up without letting the Brexit secretary know writing 120 pages is quite an arduous task, it's not done in a couple of days. At the same time the Brexit department was charged with putting together a white paper which it was working away on, uh, which is now going to be completely bulderized, taken over by the 120 pages worked out in secret in Downing Street. And this is an impossible position for anybody to work under if your um, boss is undermining your role and 
keeping things hidden from you, it's deeply unsatisfactory. Should Dominic Rubb have taken that job? Uh, Dominic is a very able man and very popular within the Conservative Party. Uh, I think he might have wanted to demand that he took charge of the negotiations in a proper constitutional manner rather than being done by the backroom boys of Downing Street. 